before I start preaching, I want to tell you that uh, Ben's been telling us Wednesday nights <laughs> that our website is quite different. And he's been putting extra things on it, music on it, and, and other things um, um, that are very neat to be stored and to be put somewhere where everybody can access them. That's, that's good. Okay, for the sermon, I chose... Uh, How to be confident in God through Jesus Christ our Savior. Or you can put an and in there. How to be confident in God and through Jesus Christ our Savior. Either way. (laughs) I thought of a lot of things while I was doing this and I kept them up front. So once I get past the first one or two ideas, uh, I'll be able to go a little faster. But first the thought is uh, from John, 1 John chapter 3, 21, but I'm going to read a little more there, so you might want to look with me at 1 John. You know I always love 1 John. One time I went to summer meeting, summer school, and they, they used uh, 1 John as one of my classes, and when I got done I told Pearl I could fly home without the airplane. <laughs> I was high. <laughs> I was really high. Uh, fantastic. When I got home, boy, I preached First John, and I added Second and Third John as well. But First John, wow! I was just amazed. Um, I keep telling people it's the uh, where you find all of the questions out of a test, you know, a, a course that you're taking. All of your questions of the Bible kind of are here, and the answers are there. <laughs> okay, alrighty. Well, first, we think of this uh, part of this verse that I quoted. Beloved, if your heart condemn us not. And there's a little more. So we want to go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 through 24. 1 John 3, 21. Um, 20 is where, uh, if your heart condemn us, God is greater than us, greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Then 21, beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, it's God's commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment, as Jesus gave us commandment, or the Heavenly Father gave us commandment as well. Verse 24, And he that keepeth his commandments, it's the Father's commandments again, dwelleth in him, and he in him, back and forth, one person and the, and the master, and thereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. So with Christ living in us, and hereby we know, so that's a proof of whether we're saved or not, Uh, we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us, the Spirit of Christ or the Holy Spirit. It's kind of the both thing, about the same thing, isn't it? But we know Jesus wants to be with us and in us and around us and help us, and the Heavenly Father wants to do the same thing. The Holy Spirit is, is a teacher for us as well as a lot of other things. So we're happy to have both. If we keep his commandments, that triggered my thinking. Uh, And also, if we want to receive something, if we want to receive them, ask, if we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. There's a kind of a two-way thing going there. We're doing this because we got that, and because of that we get this, back and forth. So we are receiving when we do those things that are pleasing in his sight, and I remember Don Nichols saying that in church, when he'd be praying and so on, he would say that. 
that we wanted to be doing things pleasing in God's sight. And that, that's right here, isn't it? Receiving. So if we're doing those things and believing in his name, that he is the son of the heavenly father, son of God, uh, Jesus Christ. So I thought, well, I should have a list. If we want to ask for something and want to do something, because we're going to receive, we will receive, if we're going to ask correctly and in the Lord. And so we know that it's available to us. So I made a little list, and of course it's just a spur-of-the-moment thing. But uh, forgiveness, we should ask for forgiveness. We'll run across another verse here too in a moment. We should ask that Jesus Christ would be in our heart and that we believe in him with a great depth. That we know the Lord and Lord know Jesus Christ and believe in him. We need to ask for salvation. Sometimes we don't know exactly the words to say, but we want that plan of salvation to be working through us. We want to receive Jesus. We want to work for Jesus. We want to testify and so on. We want that belief to be deep in our hearts. And then when we have asked for salvation, we'll be able to give it to other people. Freely have received, freely give, especially the things pertaining to salvation and eternal life. If we're saved, and that was in here too a little bit, but if we're here and, and saved, we are going to receive eternal life. So we could ask for eternal life. It's just they're all connected, interconnected to be able to do that. So I, I thought of uh, this one in, uh, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 is right here. So let's grab this one while we're just a page away. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess, oh, there is one of those, one, two, three, four, five, one of those have to be confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can ask for being cleansed with all righteousness, get rid of all unrighteousness, to be cleansed. And so we can ask for those things. Those are blessings that are available to us. I even wrote on the side here to ask for forgiveness and get right with God, to confess first, confessing always, confess, and then uh, that's our faults and our sins. And be, have a conversion that we would know that we're ready to receive from God. Conversion. Um, and our prayers would not be, would not get answered possibly. And I started, oh yes, there's verses like that. So I started looking up verses of that we want to be sure and have our prayers answered. So I went to... Uh, on the side about the same spot here, I wrote uh, Judges. So turn with me to Judges. Judges chapter 10. Chapter 10 and verse 10. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forgotten our God and also served Baal, Balaam. Uh, that's a really awful thing that they went and saved, served Balaam. Uh, there's a lot of scriptures about how they did that. We don't, not completely, but we don't need to know that. Just they did. They burned incense to this and this and this and this and in, in here and here and here. The groves and things that they didn't cut down that they were supposed to cut down. Um, they were sinning by all of that. They were serving this Balaam. And God says, you've forgotten me? I think an awful lot of people have forgotten. I was so happy when I saw that one of the states changed their flag and they cut off, they cut off, <laughs> took it out. One of the symbols of war was up in the corner of their flag. In place of it, they put a circle of stars and at the bottom, they had uh, stars missing, and they wrote in there, in God we trust. And then at the top, I don't remember, it escapes me. <laughs> but, um, I thought, wow, that is neat to see those things witness and testifying that we haven't forgotten our God. Along with this too, I want verses 13 and 14. Yet ye have forgotten me. 
and you could read the piece in between there. But they did forget him and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. I will deliver you no more. He's tired of them. He said, you're wishy-washy, you're back and forth. I will deliver you no more. Verse 14, go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you if the time of, uh, in the time of your tribulation. Well, in the United States, taking the prayer out of school, um, taking it out of homes, got rid of the Bibles, gave so many Bibles you don't know which one has the right words. Um, some are really bad. Some are just modified to modern English, but we've got so many things going on that's trying to modify or diminish our God, putting things down. And God's getting tired of it. So he says, well, you've chosen this other way. You don't want me in your classroom. You don't want me in your homes. You don't want me so on. Um, okay, uh, you go it on your own. When you're in tribulation, you're on your own. And that's not going to be good. They're going to have their tribulation. And um, the world used to look at the United States as a Christian country. I think they're getting... They, they don't believe that anymore because the facts don't show it. There is a little bit of Christianity and maybe they still hint at it, but we've lost so much, turned so much away. An unforgiven sin is, brings on guilt, not confidence in God. It brings guilt. Those that lack God's forgiveness cannot be confident in him. Forgiveness is received by confession. That, remember, I already had that word over here on the side, confession. We need to confess our sins. And the, when some of the Bible uh, sermon, prayers, some of the prayers that were said, they apologized for their nation, they apologized for their family line. You know, we have forgotten you. We have sinned. We have... Uh, not just the one person, but he needs to repent as well. <coughs> repent. Uh, when we repent and believe, you notice the word believe was in quite a bit of this, that we need to be thorough about our believing. Uh, we can be confident in God because you're back there in First John again. He said, if you're doing so and so, then this is what's going to happen. The guilt will disappear. Wow, that is a good one. So what does Mark twenty, uh, Mark 11.25 say? So let's go to Mark. Mark, uh, where did it go again? 11.25. 11.25. And when ye stand praying. Sometimes we forget that maybe we ought to stand when we pray or that we should kneel when we pray or, and we'll come across some others here. When you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any that your Father, which your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trans trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trans trespasses. When I linked those two together, it was really after just 25, but it, I needed a little bit more, and I read 26, and I, he's not going to forgive us if we won't forgive. Some churches, some ministers preach the other way around, that he'll always listen, he'll always answer, he'll, he'll always get, you know, God's just there to bail out the money and hand it over and drop the coins in your hands. And boy, this said that um, the Father will not forgive if we don't forgive. We've got to process that a little bit. We know He's a loving God, a forgiving God. He's patient. He's, but what if we turn against Him? Some people have said He's going to be a gentleman and say, okay, 
If that's what you want, that's what you can have. Mm, not good. So we need to be looking to those those answers and those things to uh, to help us. Let's see, I don't want to forget some of my notes that I've got on these other sheets. Uh, I guess I wrote that down a little further. But I'll go a little further here first before I get to the other. Um, about things that we should be doing. Well, I have uh, James over to the side here because uh, uh, there's a verse in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, chapter 3 in verse 17 where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Ah, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty in 2 Corinthians 3.17. So through prayer, through serving God, we can get this confidence uh, many believers do not possess the fullness of the Spirit. They're not serious enough, not deep enough. They've got something else in the way that they're attached to, or they won't give up, or won't, um, you know, when Jesus said, uh, do you realize if you want to serve me that I don't have a bed to lay down in? I don't have a home. I don't own a home. And he was challenging the person to think through the process and say, are you sure you want to serve me? Are you positive you're going to come with me? And then you might want to hunt the three times in the scriptures when Jesus said, you cannot be my servant. And people say, oh, no, wait a minute. No, it's there. What did he mean? The double standard. I'll do this, but I'm not sure I'm going to do that. I'm going to call you my God, my Savior, my, you know, but I'm really not going to worship the Heavenly Father. I'm really not going to do what Jesus asked me to do. I'm going to do my own thing. Think, no, this doesn't work. You cannot serve God and mammon. Okay, that's, you know, we understand that. Well, this is the same idea. If we want to really serve the Heavenly Father. Uh, they are not totally committed and are limiting the... Uh, uh, by doubts and uh, uh, resentment. Something's going on in their heart and their mind. They're limiting God's ability to work through them. They're, they're holding back on something. The Holy Spirit brings freedom. The Holy Spirit abiding, abiding presence banishes bondage, frees us from satanic entrapments. I like those statements and increases confidence. Satan, we're, we're studying Satan in the Sabbath school lesson, and I know I was troubled all day yesterday because it took about that long to fight through the scriptures that I was working on. I had to start praying in defense, in defensive mode, because Satan was troubling me. He's trying to put me in bondage or trying to trouble my mind so things wouldn't work or can't work. Satan was there. Um... A better way to think of this is a verse about uh, above where it said uh, the spirit, the spirit of the Lord is liberty. We can hang on to that. And then, of course, we, we can study from James the different verses. So go with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Most churches don't want to hear this. First off, they don't want the word law. They don't want to connect liberty with law. Uh, they don't want you to have to continue in it. They don't want that. Um, they don't mind if you forget. Just come back next week or have this app on your hand computer. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Oh, no, they, they don't want deeds. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do any works. You don't have to do any deeds, any doings, my margin puts. They don't want any of that. Let's read that again. This is God's word. 
But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, in that law of liberty, continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Okay, since we're right here, just across the page is chapter 2 here, James chapter 2 and verse 10, 11, 12. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So most churches say, okay, don't do any of the law and you won't be guilty of any because you never started, never did any. Boy, is that bad thinking. Do it again. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. When you start reading the Ten Commandments and you look at it, okay, if I don't have another God, but I'm cheating over here, I'm doing this over here, so really that's my God, so I've ruined the first one. Second one, you're not supposed to have any idols and pray to them, bow down to them. And that's exactly what they're doing. They got this other idol on the side and uh, there used to be a song that way, the idol that was behind the door. (laughs) Got to get it out behind the door and get it out of there. Um, the uh, they're hiding something, keeping something behind, so that they can um, they they try to keep, but they're not keeping. They're just not very worried about it. Uh, offend in one point. Well, yeah, you offend in this, and then it affects that. Verse eleven. For he that said, "Do not commit adultery," also said, "Do not kill." Now, if a man commit no adultery, yet he, yet if he, but if thou kill, thou art uh, become a uh, transgressor of the law. And some people coined the statement, and it was running through my head. What part of thou shalt not, don't you understand? Ah, <laughs> uh, isn't that true? It's that easy. What part of thou shalt not? Do you not understand? And you read the Ten Commandments, they're a blessing for us. They're not against us. He said he gave them laws that were good for them. So if we'll do do God's laws, and he's going to give us extra blessings. Okay, all of it's coming out good. So these are laws that we should have and not offend them. Uh, Don't need to commit adultery, just stay out of it. And you don't have to steal from somebody, you don't have to try to do killing, just stay out of it. Turn to God and stay clean, stay protected. So in verse 12, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. This law is so good for them that you don't actually mind being judged by the liberty. It's like if you have good driver's uh, training, and you have a good driver's manual, good driver's rules, and uh, you just go down the road doing what's right. Nobody bothers you. Policeman doesn't pull you over. You know, <laughs> uh, we need to do what is right. And we'll be judged by a law of liberty. There'll be peace for ourselves and righteousness. So I, I don't want to miss these verses that I, I brought over on another piece of paper here. Um, I, I looked up words where you can get yourself in trouble. Get God upset. One time I preached that for the Oklahoma conference. But do you want to make God angry? I'll tell you how. But are you sure you want to go that direction? I don't think you want God angry at you. Well, here's some right here. This is not all of them. But I think there's one chapter where it's something like uh, (laughs) 10 or more times when it says this is an abomination to the Heavenly Father. Uh, I think you better stay out of that problem. Stay out of all those things that are an abomination. Anyway, this one says uh, in Isaiah 1 and verse 15, and when you spread forth your hands, when you pray, whether kneeling or standing, and you put out your hands, usually it was bent elbows so that you could catch something. It wasn't high or out or, you know, it wasn't talking about this. It's talking about when you put your hands out before the Lord. You're looking up to heaven, have your hands out, something like that. When you spread forth your hands, that means you're praying. I will hide my eyes from you. Oh, not a good idea. What did you do that you get God upset? Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Uh, your, your hands are full of blood. 
And then I wrote on the side of there again that Judges 10 was 10, 12, 11 through 13. Um, he'll not hear us if we are doing wrong, if we have sinned and have sin on us. In Jeremiah 7, 7, 16, I probably better not read all of these uh, where they're found. I can help you with it if you want them later. But Jeremiah says, Therefore, uh, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Something is wrong. You better get it fixed, is what the problem is, right? we got to find out why he's not wanting to hear us. And another one in Jeremiah. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up and cry and pray for them, for I will not hear them. And jumping down a little further. Um, I will not hear their cry. I will not accept them. Uh, but thou sayest, I will not hear the people say that too. I'm not going to listen to God. I don't want to understand it. If I don't understand, I'm not responsible. Oh, yes, you are. That thou obeyest not my voice. They don't want to hear. They don't want to obey God's voice. And then in Amos, uh, thou, uh, take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials, maybe violins, you know, instruments. Um, he's so fed up with people that are doing wrong. They know better, otherwise he really couldn't ac accuse them. They're not learning what's right and wrong. They're not living right and correctly, and they're not doing what's right in his eyes. And they're still going on with the churchy ideas, you know, uh, and it's not working. God's not interested. What are they doing then? Well, here's one in 1 Kings uh, uh, chapter 11 and verse 8. They burnt incense and sacrificed to their gods with a small g. Wow. And down in uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, because thou hast forsaken me, they left God, and they burnt incense to those other gods. They bowed themselves before them, and they burnt incense unto them. And first, uh, Second Chronicles, that was Second Chronicles, another one, Second Chronicles, uh, to provoke, to anger the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, God of his fathers. Another one in Second Chronicles. Uh, they have forsaken me that they might provoke me to anger. Jeremiah 1, verse 16, against them touching all their wickedness. They come to him with their wickedness and they think they're going to get some help or get, get out of it. Who hath forsaken me? They did. And have burned incense to other gods. And in Jeremiah 7, will ye steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and you're still expecting God to take care of you. That's what this, the amount of the story is. You've done all of these things, and you think, oh, it's all right. I, I, I didn't get in trouble. God's not doing bad things to me. Yeah. In Jeremiah 7, verse 10, and, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Isn't that right? In the churches nowadays, people go to religious ideas, go to religious meetings, and they say, well, uh, I, I'm delivered from a responsibility so I can smoke cigarettes. I can ruin my body. I can take drugs because, you know, maybe that word isn't in the Bible. Or they try to make excuses. They try to find ways out of it. Uh, I can do these abominations. I can do this and this and this. I can live in sin. And, oh, it doesn't matter. God, God doesn't matter. God, God doesn't care. Yeah, he does care. And Jeremiah 16 through 17, for I will not hear thee. I just picked out just what I wanted to punchline. And, and what were they doing? Hey, that's an idea. Jeremiah 7. Turn with me to Jeremiah 7 because it's the whole chapter. The 
want to know what you're not supposed to be doing? <laughs> yeah, Jeremiah chapter 7. I won't read it all. I just want to point it out to you. Jeremiah 7. And it starts about 16. Chapter 7. And uh, oppress not the stranger in verse 6 and verse 7 and so on going on and on. Uh, but I want to get down to um, we are delivered to do all these abominations was in verse 10 and, uh, and God saying don't bother praying for them in verse 16 verse 17 uh, but they're still doing wrong I got a bunch of red marking here uh, but what are they doing in verse 18 the women are kneeing that's uh, Dough, making the dough work, you know, working the dough so that it'll be ready to rise. They're kneading their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. What? This is about the only place in the Bible. Why are they doing that? They're getting it from somewhere else, not from God. There's no queen of heaven, but they're making bread to it and pouring out drink offerings unto their gods, small g, that they may provoke me to anger. It was not a good thing what they were doing. In Canada, they still do what they used to do in, in the old countries. They make hot cross buns. So they make these little buns and they put a cross on it, an X actually, uh, of, um, of icing. So they call them hot cross buns. Read down through, through here. Behold my anger and my fury in verse 20. Uh, he goes right on down uh, in verse 23 and, and 24. And it's got the same imaginations of their evil heart that they're doing. And um, uh, there's more in here on the hot cross buns too, if I remember right. Or was that a different chapter? But anyway, that's you can find that by looking up in, in, uh, in your computers. This is both in seven. I know there's another one where there's three times. Is that one page over? Or is it uh, Zachari Zachariah? Cakes of Heaven. Chapter 44. Oh, I got it up there in the top. So let's go to Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah 44. I even had a paper in there to say it needed to get back there. Um. Okay, and verse 44, uh, all of this is horrible, the things that I hate and so on. In verse 4, uh, you get down to, um, i got lots of red in here, so I'm just going to skip down. In um, uh, the queen of heaven is in verse 17. They burnt incense unto the queen of heaven and they poured out drink offerings. This is another connection to the same thing that they were doing. To the other, in verse 18, the queen of heaven. Verse 19, queen of heaven. You want to make God angry? Start serving that God, whoever she is, claiming to be something of heaven. Oh boy, that's problems. It's making difficulties. Okay, um, if I go over a little more of this extra papers that I printed off. Uh, Well, I think I'm going to have to leave it there because I'm, uh, the idea is just that they're provoking God to anger. Uh, they're bowing down to these other gods. They're burning incense to these other gods. And uh, uh, God's not going to be there for them in their time of trouble. And this, Lots of this is Jeremiah 11, 11, Jeremiah uh, 19, Jeremiah 19, uh, Jeremiah 32. These people were really in trouble. They were not serving God like they should. Always it's saying burning incense, burning incense to the host of heaven. Going down to Jeremiah 44.3, same thing, the wickedness provoked me to anger. 44.5, they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, nor turned, their, turned from their wickedness and burnt incense to their gods. That's Jeremiah 44.5. So in that chapter 44, there's verse 3, verse 5, verse 8, verse 15. 
all the same kind of thing, what they were doing that was bad. In Jeremiah 48, more or less the same thing. They offered in high places and him that burneth incense to his gods with a small g. All of this is, uh, is making God very upset. And we ought to put that aside, get away from all of that stuff. Do what's right with the Lord. Okay, just a small bit here going on. If we want to be confident in the Heavenly Father and through Jesus Christ our Savior, we need to do it through fervor or not being slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That's Romans 12, verse 11. Be on with it, get on with it, and do it right. Um, we should not have selfish motives. We should not be slothful in doing God's work, God's business. Um, uh, to distort our purpose in life brings failure and defeat if we allow that to happen. Christ-like people should find delight in serving the Lord. Not that it's, we're not trying to earn our salvation by it, but we should be delighted that God wants to use us, that we can be used of the Lord, to win people to the Lord. As they work fervently and witness and win people for, for the Lord, and, and their confidence will grow. We also, if we want to be confident, through faith, through faith. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's in Hebrews 10, 22. Let's look at it because there's even more there that, that I'm going to want. Hebrews is just back a couple of pages. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know, it looks like an image picture of the Old Testament, how they cleansed people. They had to go outside the camp to take a bath because they had a problem or their sin was there on them. They had to go out there and uh, stay out uh, and wash themselves before they came back in, and it had to be after the sun was going down, so they had completed a certain day, they had to come back. Um, but that's for the New Testament here as well, to get a sure heart, pure heart, in serving the Lord. Um, many displease God and disappoint themselves because of their lack of faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, you know what Hebrews 11 is? It's all about the faithful people and how to be faithful. It's an instruction for us. What's verse 6 say? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Wow. We've got to figure that one out. Find out what faith is all about and get on with it so that we'll hold on to our faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Boy, we've got to be involved and active and strong in serving the Lord um, because God is going to reward us. We're not looking for the reward, but it's all right to have it. <laughs> okay, We'll take it. And faith gives us confidence. Uh, it, it is the, the meaning by which we Open ourselves up to God. If we have faith and we're pleasing uh, to God, we're opening ourselves to the Heavenly Father. It is also the way of a victorious, to be victorious in Christ. I thought of we were singing that song, Victory. <laughs> well, this is a way of doing it, is having faith in the Heavenly Father, knowing that he can do this and do that, and that he will be there for us, that we can trust him and we can trust Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says that for both father and son. What's in 1 John chapter 5? Remember, this is another one of those test questions. Chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory 
that overcometh the world, even our faith. It's our faith that gives us that victory to overcome the world. We must work on our faith. In verse uh, 5 as well, uh, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? We can really ruin things if we don't believe sufficiently, strong enough, and, and assure our faith with scriptures and so on that we can assure ourselves that Jesus is the Son of God. We can really spoil everything. If we limit the heavenly God, limit Jesus' abilities, or limit the heavenly Father by what we're saying and doing, we don't have faith, we don't believe, we're, we're limiting them. And then how can God work for us if we're going to limit him? There's a verse like that. Look up the word limit. You limit your God. So, if we want to be an overcomer, we need to uh, assure ourselves of the Heavenly Father and of the faith that we have in Him. This confidence in God through our uh, Jesus, our Savior, we will then have forgiveness. We will have freedom. We'll have a fervor and a fervent way of doing our life, our Christian life, and through faith in all the actions to support, supported by the scriptures. May God bless you.